Well, good morning again. We're so excited this morning to have uh, Dr. Jim Burns with us. And if you are newer to Grace and you don't know Jim Burns, well, one, I want you to get to know him, so make sure you come say hi after. Uh, Jim is the president of Homeward. His bio says that you have almost two million resources um, printed and out in the world, and so he's very smart. And um, he ministers to a lot of people in multiple different um, uh, ages and stages. But I have to tell you, my favorite memory of um, Jim Burns is we did a phase conference here. And you came up and you spoke. And our Life Stages team and some of our key volunteers went out to dinner. I don't know if you remember that. And I remember thinking, when I first started in ministry, I read the 10 building blocks of a healthy family. And that was the first message. I took some of your information from that and spoke my first message at church ever on the stage as and using your resources. And I remember sitting there at that table thinking, wow, I get to sit here. And you know what was so awesome? He was so genuine. He is real, and he cares about every generation. So with that, we're really excited and thankful that you're with us today. Hey, so, well, thank thanks. you. Thank you, thank you. So good to be here. And your church, you are most fortunate to have that woman on your team. I'm just telling you right now. I know there's others, but it's, uh, she's, she's awesome. And I've said this on stage before. I, I love being here. Um, I know that there's something going on at the sanctuary. Hi to them. Um, what's the deal with them? They, they like the old songs, not this incredible music that we just had. Okay, um, I'm not burning on y'all. Is, but, um, and then I know we're online, so great to be with you, but so good to, to see you all. And uh, I love the, the series, actually, you know, how to trust God in your next season, stretched thin. Um, I'd like to be a little more thin, but, um, oh, no, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about stretched thin, right? But I'm going to talk about how to finish well. And anytime anybody talks about how to finish well, you think of old people, right? I mean, do you ever think of these beautiful young people who are leading worship, at least on this stage, um, you know, where they are, they're not thinking about finishing well, they're just trying to finish, right? And I know when I was younger, it was just trying to get through Thursday, and, um, and then we had to do the same thing again on Friday and, you know, get through it on Friday. But I actually think the message I have for you is for the youngest person in this room, youngest per- person watching, and for the oldest as well. But again, like, you know, like I said, I mean, it's sort of true when you think about finishing well, you know, old people think about finishing well. And I know it's a bit morbid, but um, just recently, Kathy and I had to talk to a living trust person about our will and the living trust. And they said, well, what do you want on your gravestone? And I was like, gravestone? Ah, I actually want to be spread out in ashes in Maui someplace. But they said, what do you want on your gravestone? And so Kathy goes, oh, faithful to Christ and faithful to family. And I went, you know, I, I need some time. So I went online and I found what I want on my gravestone. And uh, here it is, actually, right up, coming up. I told you I was sick. (laughs) In fact, Kathy and I both said, her mother, my mother-in-law, that would have been perfect for her, okay? We didn't put that on her gravestone, but it would have been perfect for her. But it is interesting as you begin to think about finishing well. Now, remember, I'm still talking to all of you, not just the old people, okay, like me. And when we think about finishing well, all of a sudden, priorities line up. Like, I want a right relationship with God when I finish, as I finish well. And again, there were times when I was juggling and I wanted a right relationship with God, but not leaning into it. I want a right relationship with my wife. I want a right relationship with my family. This is my wife, Kathy. And uh, we were married uh, a long time ago. We were actually married 48 years ago, three months and nine days. Don't think I'm that special. I actually have an app that shows me, okay? So I'll just tell you that right now. And uh, actually, your brother was at the wedding. Ron Klein did it, who used to be a part of this church. And uh, your brother was at that, that, at that wedding. Maybe that's why we had problems. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Kathy and I have a high-maintenance marriage. And we are kind of shocked that we actually have been able to finish well because we speak on marriage. We actually have written a book together on marriage, but the truth is, is we have a high-maintenance marriage. Two dysfunctional kids you know, came together, uh, became Christians, 
and uh, got married, and we thought it was going to be super simple, and it wasn't super simple, but we have persevered, and some of the things I'm going to talk to you about have helped us in our marriage, and it might help you in, in your marriage if you're married, okay? Now, then I started thinking about my relationship with her, and by the way, when it comes to marriage, um, I just re- finished a book called Finding Joy in the Empty Nest, and in my studies on marriage in the empty nest, the only demographic where it's sliding right now and not doing very well is actually 50 and over in terms of divorce. Isn't that fascinating? So some people aren't finishing well. These are the three daughters. It was actually, a, we're doing a wedding theme today. Uh, it was Heidi's wedding, who's in between my wife Kathy and my daughter Christy. Christy's our oldest, and then there's Heidi, and then there's Kathy, and then there's Becca over on the other side, who actually, she just got married. So, yay! No more money on weddings and things. You know, I was, I, all girls. I mean, this cost us a bundle. And I asked a friend of mine who had all boys, what, what's, what do you do if you're the b- mother of the groom? And she said, well, you wear beige and you keep your mouth shut. And I went, that wasn't our story. I'm just telling you, mine was just keep pulling out the wallet and handing out more, you know, dinero to get them all married. But anyway, interestingly enough, that's my legacy right there. And they're now married. There's a couple of grandkids. In fact, there's three grandkids. And uh, there you are. Let's see, we're going to do grandkids first or family first? Put one up and we'll talk about it. That's the family. So that's, uh, and and within the family, you've got three, everything's in three. Three daughters, three son-in-laws, and three grandkids, probably with some more to come. Um, I know I should get to the Bible pretty quick, but to quote Lilo and Stitch from Disney, this is my family. It may be small, it may be broken, but it's still good. Yeah, it's still good. And I think all of us feel that way a little bit about our families. I mean, nobody has it perfect, and then the grandkids, here they come. Um, James is so proud because he is the oldest, and he just got his hair cut for first grade. Um, not short, but he just got it cut, and so he was so proud to show me. Um, he's my namesake. And man, I'm serious about my relationship with that kid. In fact, I call grandkids, next one is Charlotte, and then Huxley. I was speaking in Guatemala, not last week, but the week before, and they introduced me about nine times, and they never got the word Huxley right, because you could tell they had never heard the word Huxley. In fact, many of you have not heard the word Huxley. So they called him Harry, and they called him Harley, and all kinds of things. But anyway, that's the kids. And I call it a love affair between generations, and I'm putting a lot of energy into them right now. So excited to see them. I've been away all week, came in last night, uh, from Oregon, and um, so we get to hang out today, and that's going to be that's going to be really fun. But that's where part of my legacy is. That's where how I want to finish well. I don't care as much about some of the things that I used to care deeply about. Um, I mean, I do write, and I do. There's some things that I do, but I don't know that it's as important. I was speaking with Jack Hayford. Some of you would know the name Jack Hayford. And I was speaking with him at the Promise Keepers Pastors Conference. I was going to come on stage. The big Maranatha praise band was singing and I was about ready to step on stage at Diamondback Stadium in Arizona some time ago and I said Pastor Jack what's the secret to your leadership success this is one of the great uh, leaders in the Christian world for the previous generation and he said you know Jim he didn't pause he said you know Jim it's not what I've chosen to do it's what I've chosen not to do went unpack that one for me he said I had to say no to good things to say yes to the most important things those are some of my most important things and no doubt your family is, is critical and key in that. But I'm not going to talk as much about family. Usually I, I'm brought here and I speak on family, but I'm going to talk about you. I want to meddle in your life today just a bit. And I, I actually want to ask a number of questions, and one of them is, what are you doing to finish well? I'm looking at the youngest person in the room, and I'm thinking it's maybe never even been asked before in his life. I'm looking at some of you oldies, and maybe you think you've already you know, gotten past it, but what are you doing to finish well in your life? And that's what we're going to focus on today. And many of us are stretched so thin we can't do that, but are you proactively thinking about finishing well? Uh, another question I might ask for some of you who are married is, what are you doing to finish well in your marriage? See. Now, here's the deal. Most games are won in the second half, not in the first half. Okay, and so in the second half, we tend to do a little better because we have some of our priorities done, but some of us don't. Now, in the first half, and maybe half of you are here, you're in the first half, and how I would describe the first half is, well, it's busy, it's noisy, it's almost frenetic. This is a new word for some of you, frenetic, 
Frenetic is an adjective. It says fast and energetic in a rather wild and uncontrolled way. Frenetic pace of activity, and I would say that for Kathy and I, we've lived a lot of our life in that. You know, like I say, it's, it's fast, it's, it's a pace of activity. But perhaps the biggest problem with many of us is this breathless pace in which we live our lives. And many of us even come here on Sunday and we come and we're pretty exhausted and we're like, wow, we gotta do this again, or school is just starting or has just started depending on where you're at. And some of you uh, moms and dads who have kids who are uh, you know, back at school, maybe you're a little happy about that. Uh, because they're going to be in school. Maybe all the pressure and the prep is not exactly easy. I know that John has taken his daughter um, you know, to college, and uh, so there'll be a lot of emotion and things like that, but a lot of us are just too busy. It was the great theologian Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers who said, fatigue makes cowards of us all, and I know that I'm a lousy husband, and I'm a lousy father, and I'm a lousy worker and a Christ follower when I'm so fatigued, and uh, I love this quote, although I also hate this quote, but it's from John Mark Comer, who's up in Portland, where I was just up in the, bay, up, up in the uh, Northwest, great Northwest, and he said this, hurry is violence to your soul. And a lot of us wonder why we don't do well or we're not gonna finish well, but a lot of us, we're too busy to finish very well because we're too busy to even you know, put our energy into that. Now, this may not please you, but in my opinion, and you can disagree with me, busy people are often broken people. You know, a lot of times we in America look at someone busy and we go, oh, they must be, man, they must be really doing well. And people will say this to me, they'll go, wow, it looks like you're busy, meaning it looks like, you know, you're doing well. And actually, a lot of us have to understand that when we're so overly busy that we're not doing well. Maybe we're broken and some of my busyness comes out of my own brokenness. And in fact, I would even say that overly busy families are often broken families. We look for all the, we want to complain about the culture, we want to complain about all that's going on, we have every right to do that, but a lot of times it's that we're so overly busy as a family that we're not connecting with them, we're overcommitted and underconnected. Overly busy people produce mediocre marriages. And so this whole idea of in the first half when we're living that busy life, and it's kind of chaotic, and then we wonder why it's not going so well, and so we wake up to the second half, and we go, wow, we gotta change some things, see? It's often in the second half when we begin to realize that it's time to find some stillness and it's time to listen to our soul. You're stretched thin? Then maybe it's time for us to look at our soul. And, and truthfully, a soul without a center finds its identity in meaningless externals. That's a pretty heavy phrase that I just said, but for a lot of us, we need to hear that again, that a soul without a center finds its uh, meaning, or its identity, excuse me, in meaningless externals. So I want to speak for a moment about your soul, okay? And I'm no expert on soul work, but I simply know this, that as we look at our soul, it totally relates, and the condition of our soul totally relates to our life and our family and our marriages and how we finish well. And this may be an oversimplification, but you know, the scripture does teach us that the soul is integrated with every aspect of our life. And yet, most likely, if you're like me, very seldom do we ever think about our soul, but the Bible speaks a lot about our soul, and basically, the soul has the capacity to bring your life and your relationships toward a healthy place. You want to be in a healthy place? If you want to be in a healthy place, then maybe we have to look at our soul. You see, we have an outer world, and we have an inner world. And most of us pay all of our attention on the outer world, but we don't pay as much attention on the inner world. Your soul is the center of it all because it integrates into all of our life. A healthy soul brings goodness to your life. A healthy soul actually brings healthy relationships and an intimate marriage if you're married. But an unhealthy soul brings clutter and chaos and brokenness and pain. And for that I might be describing your life, see. And so if that is your life, then it's important for us to keep listening and kind of think about this. I love what Dallas Willard said. He said, the most important thing about you is not the things that you achieve, but the person that you become. I know some pretty successful people, 
And I actually get the privilege to spend time with a lot of successful people. But to be honest, the success that we look about in the world doesn't mean that they're successful in the important things, a right relationship with God, a right relationship with their spouse if they're married, a right relationship with their kids. In fact, I know people who have sacrificed so they've been so successful in work, business, ministry, and yet they are unsuccessful when it comes to their family life because their soul is a little bit cluttered. So in this book I told you that I wrote called Finding Joy in the Empty Nest, what's interesting is I have one phrase and it's worth the book. You don't need to buy the book, just write this phrase down, okay? And the phrase comes up and it says this, significance and a well-lived life are not accidental. And I think we really miss that, that if you want a significant life and you want a well-lived life, then it's not accidental. I actually am doing a, a memorial service to, uh, tomorrow of a very special person in my life. It's gonna be hard to do, to be honest, okay? And I know that you've had some tragedy here even at the church recently, and that's really, really tough. I totally get that. But what's interesting about this man, because he lived 68 years, and uh, that's you know young in some ways, because now the average time of death isn't even 68, it's, it's longer. But Significance in a well-lived life are not accidental, and early in his life, he made a decision to live a life of significance, but he, he, he poured his life into that in a very good way. So that's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about all this. So as I'm kind of thinking about finishing well, finishing strong in life, let me just ask you some more questions, okay? I kind of created this for my small group. I've been in a small group for 21 years, and I've been thinking a lot about finishing well, and, you know, they're more my age, so they are thinking about finishing well. And so this, is, this took us two weeks to work through, but simply as it's going to come up on your screen, the, the first one is, is, is this, what will finishing well or finishing strong look like? Now let me put some areas of life in there. First of all, in your physical life. Okay, physical health. You know, it, some of us are not healthy because we've not leaned into that. The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of times we overly spiritualize that, but what are you doing to keep your physical health well? Now, there's some things you can't do. I got cancer some years ago. My wife, Kathy, just went through a year of cancer and radiation and whatnot, and she's on the other side, at least of the, of the first initial aspect of it. We both spent some time at City of Hope, as if I know where City of Hope is. I, that's probably right. Is it that way? Oh, the wrong way, exactly. That's me. I go out the, you know, I'll, I'll go out the driveway, not of my house, I know where I live, but of other places, and I turn left, and Kathy will go, you know what, it's right where you're supposed to go, and now I just go wherever she tells me to go, and that, that's how I'm living my life. But physical health, I, there's nothing we can do about the cancer, probably, okay. But there's a lot of things we can do about a lot of issues, and that's going to help you finish well. So you make good decisions on your body. Emotional wholeness. What are you doing to finish strong with emotional wellness? You know, even when it comes to marriage and physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, connection, intimacy means connection, always precedes good physical intimacy. But sometimes we wonder why we don't have a good marriage and it's because we're not emotionally connected because nobody's been paying any attention to their own emotional well-being. Relational connection. How are you with relationships? Are you okay? You don't have to be outgoing. You could be an introvert and be, my wife is an introvert. She's incredible with relationships. In fact, she's better at relationships than some of us extroverts. And yet, the question would be, how, how are your relational connections? How's it going with your marriage if you're married? How's it going with your children if, you're, if, you're, if you have children? How's it going with your parents? Do you have deep friendships? Replenishing relationships, that's something I'm gonna talk about in a moment. You want to finish well, how are you doing with your spiritual intimacy? And again, intimacy just simply means connection. How's that going, see? Now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get us prepared. I think I have an answer for you, and I think I have some answers from the scripture. But what I'm trying to do is kind of set it up there. And then the last one is your vocational purpose and your passion. Now, some of you, I look around, might be retired, okay? And so that's, that's absolutely great, but what are you doing now with your life? Because you, you don't just retire and watch old Tiger Wood reruns of golf um, games. You actually, what are you going to do with your purpose? I was with some people who were retired this week, and they are, they are doing more purposeful living than they've ever done, and they're changing people's lives, and their, their lives are changed. It's really cool what they were doing, okay? So again, those are the questions, and like I said, games are won in the second half, what will it take for you to work on those? You kind of know the answer. You don't need a guy like me to come and tell you what the answer is. But I actually think there's a, a scripture that can help us greatly. And the scripture on how to finish well, for me, is found in Hebrews 
12, 1 through 3. And it's a scripture that I've actually preached on other times at different places, but I've never preached on it with this thought in mind. And so I've come up with four things out of this particular scripture, four points, if you would. And it's a great scripture. Many of you know it. If you've been around the church for any length of time, you would know this scripture. And I'm just going to preface it by saying, this is Hebrews 12, but in Hebrews 11, it's kind of the list of the mothers and the fathers of our faith. I mean, it has Moses and it has, you know, every, Abraham, it has all these people. Um, in that body of believers and mothers and fathers of our faith, don't forget that there's, some murder, there's a murderer, there's a prostitute, <laughs> there's liars, and so you're in good company. Those are the mothers and fathers of our faith, and I'm not saying that all of those are your issues, but it's called sinners. So don't think that these people had it all together, okay? These were the mothers and fathers of our faith, but it says this. Therefore, in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now remember the witnesses were relating to Hebrews uh, 11. There it is up on the screen. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That's a mouthful, and we're going to come back to that. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. That's kind of the story. I mean, that's kind of the answer to how you finish well. goes on to say, For the joy set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that they will not grow weary and lose heart. Are, are you weary? Have you lost heart? You know, there's a lot of people today, and even after COVID, where we just haven't bounced back. We're weary. And sometimes we're weary because we're just too busy. Other times we're weary just because of all the hassles <clears throat> that are coming our way. Sometimes we're weary because of the culture that's just ripping apart our kids. Sometimes we're frustrated and, 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 and weary and we've lost heart, but the fact is, is that that's not how we're to do it. We're, we're to finish well. And I think the scripture gives us some input. So number one, we learn from others runner, who are runners. Um, therefore, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you learn from other runners. If you want to actually figure out how to finish well, you're going to have to have other people around you to help you. Do you have mentors in your life? I'm looking at the oldest person here. Do you have mentors in your life? The youngest person, do you have mentors in your life? Because I had, have found in my own life that the only way I can get from point A to point B if I really want to excel is to have mentors who can show me the way. My parents didn't do that when it came to marriage because it wasn't like they had the world's worst marriage. They stayed married 53 years, but they didn't have a Christ-centered marriage. So Kathy and I had to find other people who could kind of help us. Do you have peer support? Have you leaned into peer support or are you doing too much of it on your own? Do you have marriage mentors? Do you have replenishing relationships? I used that word before, but, but do you have replenishing relationships? Do you have deep re friendships? You know, you have VDPs, very draining people in your life, and you have BIPs, very inspiring people. And the question I would ask you is, I, everybody has VDPs. Maybe you're a VDP for the person sitting next to you. I don't know. But what about the BIPs? I found that in my own life, I had to lean into VIPs. It's, for me, it's Tuesday morning. It's 21 years of opening up the kimono and confessing our sins to one another so that we would be healed. That's what the Bible says. It's sharing and accountability, and it's laughing. We went fishing this year in Montana this summer, and we had a blast. Okay, I'm not saying it's all like super intense. I'm just saying I have, I have friends who replenish me. And I'm a better husband and a better father because I drive 30 minutes to that meeting Tuesday morning, which I will at 7 o'clock, and I'll drive back. I don't live right in the same neighborhood, but that's an important place for me. In many ways, you know, John Dix has, is that. I, I don't meet with him on a regular basis. I see him every once in a while. Um, last time he came down my way, we had barbecue. And you know what? He's a replenishing relationship for me. Um, he's a cheerleader. He's an encourager. I mean, he's a pastor. He's a shepherd. And so, again... You can have every Tuesday morning people or you can have people who kind of around your life. Uh, that's just how it is. Who are the VIPs in your life? I used to be a youth pastor and what I always used to say to kids, students, was you, know, become, you become like the people you hang around with. Are you hanging around with the right people? See, Because if you're not, then you're probably not following that particular illustration of learning from other people. Runners, for me, mentors are big. And, you know, the first time I met C.S. Lewis, he was dead. 
It was actually in a book, okay? <laughs> and uh, I read his book, Mere Christianity, and it blew my mind. And so then I went, oh, wow, he has these other books called Chronicles of Narnia. I'll read the Chronicles of Narnia. And then I found other books. And what was interesting was I never met C.S. Lewis, but I did my PhD right near where he was a professor, and he was, his presence, even after he died, was there. And I'm telling you, I learned a lot from him, and I would call him a mentor, even though, of course, I never met him. And so I'm suggesting to you that if you actually want to learn from other runners, if you, let's take family. You read a parenting book a year. You read a marriage book a year. There's great stuff out there. And, and so when you lean into that kind of material, <clears throat> guess what? It affects you, and it helps you, and it actually gets you on the same page, especially if you're married. It gets you and your spouse on the same page if you read it together. So secondly, for, to, to finish well, is to run light. Now, for, if you're stretched thin, this is hard to do. So you're going to have to, you know, not be so stretched in some ways. But the Bible says this, at, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. What's hindering your life? Is it busyness? When I talked about busyness, are you going, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. I'm not saying we're all going to move to Wyoming and live in a commune. I'm saying we have to figure it out here and now. And it actually takes a lot of discipline. In fact, Paul said to Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And in that discipline, he was using a term that was kind of an athletic term. What I've learned is that I've had to learn to discipline myself for the purpose of godliness by saying a word. And I was just, not this week, last week, but the week before I was in Guatemala. So I've got it down in English and Spanish. You want, you want to hear the word? Want me to teach you the word? Okay. Do you want it in Spanish or do you want it in English? I can do both. Both? Okay. Well, let's start with Spanish. Okay. No. No. Here's English. No. I just can't do that. So I'm a people pleaser. I'm the president of the People Pleasers Anonymous Club. And you know what? As a people pleaser, it's really hard for me to say, no, I can't do that for you. But what I found is that if I don't have margin in my life, I'm of no benefit to finishing well. In fact, many of the people who don't finish well are people who don't say no, I can't do that. Kathy always used to say, she hasn't said it for a while, so maybe I'm getting better, I don't know. She says, she always used to say, we have a Messiah, he's doing very well, Jim, you do not need to replace him. And I say that to soccer moms, hockey dads, because they're doing it big time. You know that, Amber, because of the, you know, you see this with the, with the moms and the dads that you're hanging out with. We're so busy doing important things that, again, we miss the most important things. So let us throw off everything that hinders. What's entangling you? And maybe there is a sin that's entangling you. Sin means to miss the mark. Join the club. You're all sinners. We're sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. See? And I love what Peter Drucker, the management guru, says. First things first, last things not at all. And I've had to be able to, if I was going to do this, my new word is declutter. And so if you want to finish well, you're going to have to declutter. If your life's too filled with clutter, then you probably are running with chaos and quite possibly some brokenness. So what does declutter mean? Okay, declutter doesn't mean, you know, well, you, for me, it would be cleaning out the closets and cleaning out the garage because Kathy wants me to do that. She actually said to me this week, she said, you know, Jim, you have three T-shirt drawers. Do you really need three drawers of T-shirts? And I go, well, yes, I do. She goes, some of your T-shirts have holes under their arms. I said, I know, but I sweat in those. Those are just my sweat t-shirts. And she goes, well, but they're ugly. And I said, no, they all have meaning. So she goes, I want a two-drawer t-shirt. By the end of the summer, I want two drawers, not three. I'm panicked because I honestly don't know what to do because each t-shirt that I have sweat in is a very important, has a, has a message for me, right? And so she's, then she said, I mean, this is my wife of 48 years, she goes, it's going to be a two t-shirt drawer because sometime when you're gone, I'm just going to start throwing these things if you don't do it. So I'm, I'm like in trouble. I need marriage counseling, see. But what, what will you do? Have you figured it out? Do you, the run lighter principle, or are you still having to work through this? Okay, it's hard. There's a great deal of tension, especially for those of you who are young parents. I'm not saying it's easy. But what can we do to, you know, kind of, again, kind of declutter? Kathy and I had this. When we first got married, um, again, broken families, and we came together, and uh, I, we'd, we, had, uh, we actually went to Zoo Pacific right down the street, and we got married one week after, and we, we were at a, a church called Yorba Linda Friends where I was the youth pastor, and then I went away to grad school at Princeton, New Jersey, and we came back, and we were at a church in Orange, 
And the church had four kids in the first Sunday school. I just remember this so well, and I was like, I can handle four kids. Well, in about three months, it had 100, and then it had 300, and then 400, and then it became one of the larger youth groups in America. They actually doubled my salary in one year. That's a greater miracle than Jesus walking on water. <laughs> there's any staff here, you know what, exactly what I'm saying. And it was still a lousy salary, believe me. But one day after this, we're at the salt and pepper restaurant in Orange, and I shouldn't say that because we're close enough. Somebody probably owns it. Mark, if he's still here, he probably owns the salt and pepper restaurant, <laughs> uh, along with, you know, all those other cool places. That, but um, we were at the salt and pepper restaurant. It's kind of a, well, a divey diner type, but we like that. And Kathy's lips started to quiver. And I had been married long enough to realize that when her lip quivered, I was in trouble. I didn't know why, but I just knew that her lip would start quivering and I'm in trouble. What's weird is all three of my daughters have quivering lips. I think it's hereditary. We even had a golden retriever who had like a quivering lip. I'm like, what is this? So her lip starts to quiver and she said, Jim, I don't think we should have children. No children. On our first date, we talked about children. Kathy, you're a teacher, and you're a kid magnet, and even in the youth group, the kids like you better than they like me. What do you, what do you mean? You don't want kids? And she goes, no, I want kids. I just don't know that you would be a very good father. Ah, oh, because you're never here. You're always busy. You work six or seven nights a week. I mean, what is this? Are we, is this how we're going to live? I know this church has been successful, and I feel like I'm in competition with God. You're not God, but God is doing a great blessing. We have all these kids, but what about our kids? Wow. So I had to admit something to her. I said, Kathy, I'm having an affair. Okay, now the affair wasn't with a woman. Not with a man either. Okay, my affair, my mistress was my job because my low self-esteem needs were being met by my job. People at the church liked me, the kids liked me, the parents liked me, the pastors liked me because the church was growing like crazy, mainly because of an amazing youth group that was happening that had little to do with me, see. And then here's my wife saying, I don't even know if we should have kids. And so that night at the salt and pepper restaurant, on a piece of paper, we wrote down three things that would help us think through running a little lighter. Number one is we decided to have a non-negotiable date night. I'm not turning this into a marriage series. I'm just simply saying that for us, we weren't dating. And so because we weren't dating, we weren't connecting. So we made a decision way back then to do that, and we hardly ever miss. I mean, I was in front of, I, I spoke, I've, this is my 11th message this week because I was at a conference where I was speaking, and all new messages, I mean, I was just doing messages galore. But on Wednesday, we ditched all the people that we were at this conference, and we went and had our date. And I felt kind of guilty about it because the speakers are supposed to kind of mingle with all the people, but guess what? Nobody, under, nobody knows. And nobody went, oh, I can't believe you weren't there. And we had a good time, see. So a non-negotiable date night. Secondly, we decided to only be out about three nights. And what was fascinating about that is because we were out too many nights. The average person in ministry is out five nights a week. And unless they're working a swing shift, which most ministry people don't, that's too much. At least it was too much for us. So I went to my pastor and I said, look, I'm going to keep doing the same stuff. I'm going to move some things around. I'm only going to be out three nights a week because I really need to put some energy and effort into my marriage. The pastor said, that's a great idea. The first week, the pastor asked me to come to a meeting that would have been four nights. And I said, I can't do it. And I thought maybe I'd get fired. And, uh, but you know what? He didn't fire me. And then I found out later that at that meeting, I got all the information I needed in one minute. And you know what? I can't say that every night Kathy and I are having these amazing moments. It was just that we needed some decluttering and run lighter, see? And then the last one was that Kathy had veto power over my schedule. In fact, even this speaking request, John does what John does so well. He texts me. So I get, you know, we have a whole speaking committee. We fill out pages and all these kind of things. John, he texts me and he goes, 28th of the 20, 21st of the 28th. And so I sent it over to Kathy. And she goes, and, and it was after, literally, I, I flew in late last night, and I'm here. And um, Kathy goes, oh, you love John, you love Grace Church, yeah, yeah, great, that's fine. I thought, does she want me out of her life, or what's the, what's the story? And we've been together. So the point being is that, you know, she, she, it's not like I turned her into the big ogre, but she understood things. In our, she understood the pace of life, see. And I think that's, that's key and critical. So again, I use that illustration to say we had to learn to declutter. Thirdly is run with endurance. It's a very interesting scripture. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It's fascinating that actually 
A lot of times, the writer of the Hebrews, and people really don't know who wrote Hebrews, it could have been Paul, but maybe not, but Paul used a lot of illustrations about running. And what I'm saying is in our life, we are not running a sprint. We are running a marathon. And so to run a marathon, you have to learn to pace yourself, and that's what I've been trying to learn if I'm gonna learn how to finish well, because we're stretched so thin already, we have to learn how to, how to pace ourselves. And, the, and it says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. So I'm literally saying, you know, run with endurance, a similar, similar phrase. So it's interesting that Amber used the word grit because it's kind of a new, cool, popular word. And she's cool and new, which well, she's cool and groovy. You can tell that I'm old because I just used the word groovy. Um, <laughs> I've tried to bring that word back and I can't do it. Kids are like, that's a really dumb word. I'm, I'm trying to, except I teach my grandkids groovy. Grandpa's groovy. And except Charlotte goes, Grandpa's goofy. No, 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 not goofy, <laughs> groovy. She can't get that right, right? So again, grit. What is grit? Grit is passion and perseverance coming together. And that's grit. That's endurance. And we all need grit to finish well. If you look at grit, there's going to come on to the screen, but there, maybe there's not going to come. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so grit, it's a noun. <clears throat> and I took this right from the dictionary. Courage and resolve, strength of character. He displayed the true grit of a Navy pilot, okay? So a woman named Angela Duckworth made this word popular because it's the most, one of the most popular TED Talks. Bazillions of people have watched her TED Talk, and she wrote a book on it. You know what she said? I studied successful edu people in education and, and successful people in business, and it wasn't intelligence, it was their grit that made them successful. Isn't that interesting? You wanna finish well? You're gonna take some grit. What are the synonyms? Courage, bravery, backbone, spirit, strength of will, moral, valor, fortitude, toughness, hardness, resolve, determined, resolute. That's what we're talking about. So what grit means for me, and I'm gonna lay it on you, is do whatever it takes to make your top priorities your top priorities. Because you know what your top priorities are. We don't always do it, I don't always do it, but if I'm gonna finish well, and if I'm stretched in my life, it's really hard for me to do the top priorities because I'm just trying to get by, like I said. So I, have a, I have a research that we use with marriage again. I don't know why I'm talking so much about marriage, but um, troubled marriages. So this research just came out that people who have troubled marriages, if they persevere for five years, 78% of those people say that their marriage is better off. Isn't that amazing? What we tend to do in America is it's not going well, the grass is probably greener, and we jump too quickly. But what this research is showing, by the way, this is secular research, this is not Christian research, but the secular research says that if you'll stick with it and you'll persevere and you'll put some endurance into it and you'll lean into it, then it's gonna get better. John Ortberg says this, and it's in my, I literally have this in my office. He says, love God and do the right thing. Now, I've added in my office, I have, love God and do the right thing, and I put repeat daily for the rest of my life. And so what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life, I'm going to try to love God and do the right thing. And then I'm gonna repeat it tomorrow. Because you know what? It's only good for the day. <laughs> and sometimes for the hour, okay? So what I'm saying to you is if you wanna finish well, that's what you do. It's, it's, that's the answer. See what I'm saying? woman said to me one time, untended fires soon become nothing but a pile of ashes. And I know that to be true. I can stir up those ashes to kind of make them be a fire, but if I don't tend to them, it's not good. One of the ways we do that is to find our thin place. So we're stretched thin, but let me give you a new definition of thin. Thin, spiritually, is the distance between heaven and earth. This is actually an old teaching. Actually an old teaching from hundreds of years ago. But what they called it was the thin place where heaven and earth are close. You know where my thin place is? It's a chair in my living room. It's a chair that Kathy wants to get rid of, just like my t-shirt drawer. And I just sit there. And it, it has a rip, not from me, but from the kids. It has pin marks, which drives her nuts because I, that's where I do my Bible every morning. I did it this morning. I mean, I'm, I was tired flying in and whatnot, but I got up and I did my one-year Bible and I'm obsessed about it. And then I wrote in my journal I put adoration, so I put some scriptures of praise. I put confession, I confess my sins. I put thanksgiving. And I actually you know, put some names here from the church and this church. I mean, but other things, nothing sexy, 
just simply putting some reasons why I'm thankful, and then I, I put supplications and a prayer request or five or ten. And, my, and I show, like I show my grandkids all the time, James. I go, James, what's that? He goes, that's my name. I go, I pray for you every day. Charlotte, what's that? Scribble. Actually, it's Charlotte, but you can't read yet. And I pray for you every day. Actually, I'd never show him that because he'd just like eat the page or whatever it, you know, going to almost be too. But that chair is my thin place. Is it someplace where I feel God's presence every day? No, but I do it. For me, it's a walk on the beach. I live in Dana Point, so I live by the beach. And so it's that walk on the beach. Sometimes I feel God's presence, sometimes I don't. But the truth is, do we have a thin place? Do you have a thin place? Some people might say it's Lake Arrowhead. I don't care where it is. It could be out in the, it could be at a park. It could be climbing up one of the hills, Glendora Mountain Road, whatever it is. I'm just saying, do you have a thin place where heaven and earth are close, and do you find that often? What, the question I have to ask is, what in my life has gone unattended and uncultivated? That's a big question. What in my life, what in your life has gone unattended or uncultivated? Okay, remember when I talked about physical health, emotional, relationships, all that stuff, spiritual intimacy? Well, if you took that list and then you asked that question, what is in my life that has gone unattended or uncultivated, you probably know the answer to how you finish well for you. And what's interesting is how you finish well is different than how I'm going to finish well. I mean, I wish it was all the same, but it's not. But I think these are great principles. And the last one is keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, we expect that, but it's actually right here in the Bible. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. We drift. Every single one of us drift. I don't care if, you, again, you're the youngest person or the oldest person. We all drift. That's the natural tendency. So I like to body surf and surf and all that kind of stuff. And so when I was growing up, I would go down Highway 39, which is actually right up here, but it would, turns into Beach Boulevard, and I would go to the beach at Beach Boulevard in Huntington Beach. And the, sometimes the, the current would take us all the way to the pier, which is a long ways, and then we would hitchhike back. I would not suggest that kids do that today, but that's what we would do. But you could just get in the water and you just drift. Well, all of us drift. If we're not swimming, sometimes, honestly, even against the current. And so it's making course corrections all the time, but the way that you make the course corrections is to do what that scripture says. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. I had to keep my eyes on the lifeguard station at Beach Boulevard, or I was going to end up at the pier, which is a good long distance away, see? And if I'm now changing the illustration, but if I'm in a boat and I'm going to Hawaii and it drifts 1%, I'm going to end up in Australia. That's what we do sometimes. And all of a sudden we look up and we're lost, see? And so the way to do that is to keep our eyes on Jesus. So we have a ministry that mirrors our ministry in South Africa, and I was with the guy that runs it and his dad, who actually lives in Tanzania, and his dad um, is basically a guide and takes people up Kilimanjaro. Now Kilimanjaro, the hike to Kilimanjaro is not like Everest. It's just a long hike, and it's uphill, and you go for like six or seven days, right? And I said, do most of the people make it? And he goes, some people don't. I said, well, who makes it and who doesn't? And I'm thinking he's going to tell me, it's the people who've worked out the hardest, the people who are in amazing shape. He said, it's actually the people that keep their eyes on the, on the peak of Kilimanjaro. And he said, the problem is you don't see the peak all the time. So as, my, as the guide, what I'm saying is the peak is right there. See where those clouds are? I want you to imagine the peak. And I would show pictures of the peak. He said, they make it. When they get their eyes off the peak, they start grumbling and they say they can't make it and they, they, they lose energy and they're all cold because they start really warm. You start at the base and it's really warm and then you get freezing. Well, oxygen issues, all kinds of things, but if you keep your eye on the peak, well, that's what this scripture is saying. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I love this quote and with this quote, I'm gonna ask you only one more question after this quote and then we'll, we'll call this a day. But I love this quote, it's from Andy Stanley. I was with Andy and Sandra three weeks ago at their church, and I love this man, but I think this is a really good quote for us to end. The choices we make privately almost always have consequences that branch out publicly. Oh, there it is. Every decision we make affects someone, church, business, or family, especially the people closest to us. So the point I'm saying 
as Andy said it a lot better than I could, is the choices we make privately have consequences. And I'm suggesting that perhaps we begin to make those choices, choices that help us finish well. Last question, what private decisions can you make today to fix your eyes on Jesus? I think you know the answer. Now let's go do it. So the question today is how do we finish well? Again, it sounded like I was just talking to old people. I'm not just talking to old people. I'm talking to every person in here. You want to finish well, wherever you are, whether you're in the second half or the first, remember that games are won in the second half. But games that are won in the second half are often done because it had a great foundation in the first half. And let's say you didn't have a good foundation in the first half. Fine. There's some teams that come back in the second half. So what kind of decisions do you need to make so that you can have a significant end of your life? It's a good question to think about even as we, as we uh, worship today.